Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Edward Slingerland for a second time. He's Professor of Asian Studies at the University of British Columbia. And today we're going to focus on his most recent book, Drunk, How We Sip, Danced and Stumbled Our Way to Civilization. So Dr. Slingerland, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, great. It's nice to be back. Okay, so, I mean, let's perhaps start at the beginning. Do we know how long ago people started drinking alcohol? Um, yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> so, um, you know, our primate lineage is adapted to alcohol consumption. So we've got, uh, we're part of an ape lineage that probably around 10 million years ago started developed enzymes that allowed us to break down alcohol in that naturally occurs in fermenting fruit. So clearly we've been dealing with small quantities of alcohol for a long time. In terms of when people started seriously drinking, like when we started deliberately making alcoholic beverages, this po probably preceded agriculture. So we're talking, you know, 7,000, maybe 8,000 years ago. So we've got, um, there's a, you know, the standard story about alcohol is that we mastered agriculture. And then as a side effect, we noticed that some of the grain that was left over would ferment if we left it for a while. And so alcohol followed agriculture is the standard story. And in the 1950s, it started to get challenged by advocates of what came to be known as the beer before bread hypothesis who argued that in fact, um, it looks like hunter gatherers were, were getting together and fermenting what beers and various types of wines, even before there was ag agriculture. And that in fact, agriculture, the primary motivation for agriculture, the first motivation may have been to get drunk, not to make bread. <laughs> so people were gathering you know, early sites like Gobekli Tepe um, we know were, were built by hunter-gatherers, they, were, they weren't settled agriculturalists. Um, and there's some suggestive, there's no direct evidence of alcohol at that site, but there's a lot of suggestive indirect evidence. Um, and in other places around the world, so for instance, the, um, the ancestor to modern corn, to modern maize uh, that was cultivated in South America is not actually not very good for making grain. Like if your goal was making tortillas or grain type things, um, this would not be a very appealing species. What it's great for is making chicha, which is a beer-like substance you can make out of, that's now made out of maize. Um, so the, there's a lot of people arguing at work in South America that the, the, the impetus to start uh, domesticating what became maize was to make chicha, not to make food. So people have been, basically people have been drinking for as long as they've been doing anything in an organized fashion on a large scale. Yeah, uh, that last bit is very interesting. So was uh, alcohol one of the factors behind the development of agriculture? Yeah, so that's the, the beer before bread. People are arguing that that was the driver. So basically people settled down to start seriously cultivating grains to make beer, essentially. And then they were also making bread and other things. And so it's actually the impetus to civilization was the, the drive to get intoxicated. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it may have just historically been the case that this was one of the early drivers of uh, driving hunter gatherers to agriculture. And then in the book, I'm arguing once they got there, once they started gathering in large groups and forming large scale societies, alcohol and other chemical intoxicants were a tool that enabled them to <clears throat> manage this evolutionary transition in a more effective way. Because going from hunter-gatherer lifestyle to, you know, even village level society, Neolithic village level society is a bit of a shock evolutionarily. It's a very different lifestyle than anything we ever had in our evolutionary history or our ancestors did. And so I'm arguing that alcohol and other chemical intoxicants were one of the tools that helped us to make, make that transition. Mm -hmm. But just to take a few steps back, during our evolutionary history, did we have access to any naturally occurring sources of alcohol? Yeah, absolutely. So that's why we have these enzymes. That's why we're, our ape lineage is pre-adapted to 
being able to detoxify alcohol. And it, we share this with other uh, species that eat fruit. So birds, there's a lot of other species that eat fruit that have the same enzymes. So I mean, because alcohol is poisonous, right? So um, we seem to be in an ancestral lineage that adapted to eating fruit. And one of the um, hypotheses about humans in particular is that we come from a lineage that was adapted to eating rotten fruit. So once we started, once we left the trees and we were on the ground, we weren't getting the fruit at its optimal ripeness. So tree living primates were, um, and we were left having to deal with whatever fell to the ground was probably overripe. And the more ripe a piece of fruit gets, the higher the alcohol content. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it seems pretty clear that we adapted to um, eating ripe and maybe overripe fruit on the jungle floor, stuff that's fallen down. And there have been, there are some um, primatologists, archaeologists who have argued that that was our real uh, kind of killer app ad adaptation that allowed us to outcompete the um, tree living primates. So yeah, we've been we've we've had access to naturally occurring alcohol for a long time, mm -hmm. but naturally occurring alcohol is very what you get in a piece of overripe fruit is pretty low level of alcohol and not very much of it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it really was a leap to start actually deliberately producing alcoholic beverages. Mm -hmm. So can we say that there are also other species that also like consuming alcohol? Yeah, no, there definitely are. Um, so um, other primates will drink, if they get out access to alcohol, they'll drink it. There's um, perhaps apocryphal stories of elephants breaking into stills and getting drunk and tr wildly trampling things. Um, there's reasons to doubt that just because um, elephants are so large, they would have to consume a just absolutely massive amount of alcohol. Um, clearly, um, some birds are attracted to alcohol. And then there's um, fruit flies, for instance, are, are very attracted to the smell of alcohol and seem, again, adapted to uh, feeding on ripe or overripe fruit. And so their ecological niche is being able to handle and detoxify the alcohol because they're able then to take, take advantage of the calories. So there's lots of species who are attracted to alcohol and who will consume human alcoholic beverages if they happen to have access to it, um, but also overripe fruit that has alcohol in it. Mm -hmm. But is there any particular reason from an evolutionary perspective for us to like to consume alcohol? I mean, is it because it's high in calories or something like that? Yeah, it is high in calories. And so what probably the dominant, so the, the standard theories about why we like alcohol, I think the dominant one has always been the hijack hypothesis. So um, alcohol just happens to hijack reward circuits in our brain that evolve for other reasons. And then alcohol is basically able to, to parasitize those reward circuits. That's, I think the dominant theory has been that. Um, so I call those in the book hijack theories. Mm -hmm. There are also mismatch theories. So these are theories that it was, our taste for alcohol was adaptive at one point in the past, but it's not anymore. And the most prominent of those is uh, Robert Dudley at UC Berkeley, who's got, he wrote a book about this called The Drunken Monkey. So it's called The Drunken Monkey Hypothesis. And his claim, his idea is that um, we adapted to this ecological niche where um, we were able, alcohol is very, also a very volatile molecule um, and it's pretty light, it's small molecule, it travels long distances. So he thinks that alcohol served as a kind of dinner gong for our ancestors. So we, we can smell alcohol from a long distance away that signaled to us that there was a um, high calorie package waiting to be exploited. And we were able to follow the smell and track down the overripe fruit. And it is a big calorie, it's got a lot of calories. in it. So if you were able to locate these packages of calories and consume them, and then we had the machinery to detoxify the alcohol once we got to the fruit. Um, so he thinks that, that it's adapt it was adaptive for us to like the taste of alcohol and like the smell of alcohol because it led us to these rewards. But that then becomes very um, counteradaptive when we live in a modern society where we have access to supermarkets and high potency wines and things like that. Um, so yeah, so so and there's there's it's a it's a controversial view, um, but that it certainly is a case that 
alcohol has some benefit. So it's got calories. Um, there may be some antiseptic properties to alcohol that are useful. So another another kind of mismatch hypothesis is that um, we started once agriculture started and we started living in large uh, sedentary groups, we had problems with water quality. So people were putting their sewage in the local water sources, and so the water became contaminated. And so if we made took that water and turned it into uh, beer, it, it purifies it. So if you take dirty water and you, you ferment it, it becomes drinkable. Um, and so one of the, this is the dirty water hypothesis that became adaptive to like to drink beer because beer was safe and water was not. Um, so that's, I look at that hypothesis as well in the book. But the problem with that one is that the other way to deal with dirty water is just boil it. <laughs> Lots right. of people figured, figured that out. Um, and um, that gives you all the benefits of um, fermenting without the cost of the dangers of alcohol. And there are a lot of dangers of alcohol. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's there's all sorts of mismatch theories out there as well. And, and it's possible that little bits of those mismatch theories are contributing factors. But I don't think any of those could be the whole story. Mm -hmm. So is it the case or do we know if all human societies have alcohol? Not, not all. So it's amazingly widespread. You see it all over the world. Um, there are interesting pockets of absence of alcohol. Um, so one of those was North America. So, and that's a bit puzzling because you could certainly make alcohol in North America. Um, the, another uh, area is parts of the Pacific don't have alcohol. Um, but I think what I argue in the book is interesting is that in the few places where you don't have alcohol, you have a very similar chemical intoxicant that takes its functional role. So in the parts of Oceania that don't have alcohol, they use kava, which is this tuber-based intoxicant that has effects that are, it's different than alcohol, but it has importantly similar functional effects. Mm -hmm. And then in North America, where they didn't have alcohol, they used tobacco laced with hallucinogens in, in many, in basically exactly the same ways that other cultures used alcohol. So I think it's significant that in the few places that don't didn't have alcohol, you see other chemical intoxicants filling that functional niche, mm -hmm. which suggests which suggests that there's a functional vacuum that has to be filled. Right. In the case of East Asians, I mean, I, I, perhaps I'm saying the I'm not saying this right, but isn't it the case that they have some issue with alcohol in terms of their physiology? That some of them. Uh, can't really process alcohol adequately. Yeah, yeah. So I talk a, at some length about this. This It's actually a set, it's two different mutations that travel yeah. together, which itself is interesting. Um, and what's happening, it's sometimes called the Asian flushing syndrome. Mm -hmm. So what's happening there is uh, alcohol gets broken down in your body in two steps. So first step, it gets broken down into this also very nasty substance. Um, that then gets broken down in a second step into something that's easy for your body to get rid of. Right. What's happening with this set of mutations is the, that first enzyme is hyper-efficient. So it's, it's really good at breaking down alcohol into the second substance that's also quite toxic. Um, but then their enzyme that breaks that down into acetic acid is not very functional. And so this, this, uh, intermediary substance builds up in the body and that's what causes the flushing and the nausea and all these negative um, symptoms um, so it's 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 an interesting and it's what's interesting is it's two different mutations so there's got to be something going on for them to arise and stay together and they've arisen independently in other parts of the world so it's um, it's arisen independently in parts of Europe and the Middle East mm -hmm. so what the reason I bring this up is because you know this is a, when I'm arguing against the hijack theory. So the hijack theory is, yeah, alcohol is really costly. Um, and it's all these negative effects, but you know, what are we going to do? It um, hijacks these reward centers in the brain. Um, the Asian flushing gene is basically the genetic solution to the problem of alcohol. Um, the, it's actually the, the, uh, a chemical equivalent to this one that raises that intermediate substance, um, is used as a treatment for alcoholism. 
because if you have this gene combination, you don't like to drink. You have a drink, you have these negative physiological reactions, you stop drinking. Um, so if alcohol were an evolutionary mistake, this mm. is the solution to that. This is the fix for that mistake. But what's interesting is this gene complex arose probably about 7,000 years ago, um, and probably not coincidentally around the same time that rice agriculture started. So it arose in Southeast Asia, in this, uh, on the coast in the Yangtze River Valley, a very specific geographical region. Um, and it spread a bit. So it spread to Japan, to Korea a bit, but it's pretty much stayed in place. It's not, if you look at the contemporary distributions, I reproduce a map of the distributions of this gene. Um, it hasn't moved very much in 7,000 years, which is, if it seems like a great solution to the problem of alcohol. And yet it just sits there and doesn't really go anywhere. So there's a lot of debate about what what the evolutionary forces were driving um, this this gene complex. It's it probably has something to do with um, resistance to tuberculosis, mm -hmm. um, and it also there's some suggestions that you're more resistant to fungal uh, infections and um, fungal poisoning, which may uh, be an adaptation to dealing with grain. You know, these are societies that are producing rice and storing it where you're gonna to have to deal with spoiled rice and things like that. Um, so there's a debate about what the, what the forces are driving this, but I, give it, I use it as an example of how <clears throat> we have a genetic solution to the quote problem of alcohol, and yet it hasn't really spread very much. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, there are, there are small, there are pockets of humans who don't deal with alcohol very well, but they're pockets. Mm -hmm. So, um, regarding the effects that we get from alcohol, the psychological ones, is it that we can also obtain them using other intoxicants or is alcohol special in any way? Yeah, um, alcohol is special. It's, I call it the king of intoxicants for a variety of reasons. Um, one, of, one of them is just that it's really easy to make, like you can make it out of almost anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> It occurs naturally very easily, so it's easy to discover. Um, but then just pharmacologically, it's, it's been referred to as a pharmacological hand grenade. So other intoxicants tend to focus on particular brain networks or do very have very specific effects. Um, Alcohol is crazy. Like it's doing about eight different things at the same time and on different time scales. So... Um, it's a really complex intoxicant. It combines the effects of um, Prozac and Valium and meth. And um, yeah, it's just, it's a very complex drug that's doing a lot of different things at the same time. And that in itself seems to be use, functionally useful. Um, the other nice thing about alcohol is it tends to, its effects tend to be relatively uh, standard across individuals mm -hmm. unlike so i look at other chemical intoxicants like cannabis and cannabis has some many of the same effects as alcohol but cannabis is really variable different and in, different individuals have very different responses to cannabis um, alcohol is pretty predictable like people are going to have similar responses to it it's easy to dose cannabis is difficult to dose um, alcohol is very easy to dose um, because we have this machinery dedicated to breaking it down, it, it has relatively short effects. So you can use it to get the effects you want, and then an hour or two later, you're fine again. Unlike, say, psilocybin mushrooms, right? <laughs> psilocybin <laughs> mushrooms are really difficult to dose. They're, uh, they last for a really long time. Um, they're not, the cognitive effects are not easy to combine with things like socializing, um, signing treaties, uh, agreeing on contracts. So alcohol seems to hit the sweet spot um, in a lot of different ways. Easy to make, um, tech, you know, technically simple, universally available, uh, broad range of effects, but predictable and uh, relatively short duration and relatively little impact on um, your psychology the next day if, if you're using it in moderation. Mm -hmm. So it just seems to have, it seems to be like an ideal technology in that regard.
Yeah. So I would like to ask you more about the social benefits of alcohol. But before that, in the book, you characterize humans as communal, creative and cultural. Why are those three traits important for this discussion when it comes to understanding the benefits of alcohol? Yeah. So what, I, what I'm arguing, so I have a whole chapter dedicated to this weird ecological niche that we occupy as a as a primate. Um, so the question is, why would we need crutches like this, essentially? Why would we need these kind of cultural technologies? And it's because we are this uh, creative, communal, and cultural uh, uh, species. So creative, we're really dependent on culture and technology in a way that no other species is, right? Um, lions don't need to figure out how to capture their prey and develop tool sets and hunting strategies, right? They just do their thing. Um, so, and, and technology depends on individual and collective creativity. So we're really dependent on creativity in a way that other animals are not. And alcohol has, as I document in the book, um, these, these effects on boosting creativity. Um, we're, we're cultural, we have to be open to learning, we have to be um, trusting of other people and willing to take information on faith. Um, and, and, and we're communal, we need to cooperate, we need to figure out how to, unlike uh, almost every other species in the world, we need to figure out when we're living in large scale societies, how to trust and cooperate with Strain, effectively strangers, unrelated strangers, right? People who are not genetically related to us and people who we can't track. So reciprocal altruism can't be what's going on either because these are often one-off interactions with strangers. So we need to be able to trust this much broader group of people than we're evolutionarily adapted to. And I've, I've argued, you know, previous research I've done with my colleague at UBC and elsewhere um, has argued that religion has been is one cultural technology that we partic particular types of religion, pro-social religions are one what technology we use for uh, ba basically leapfrogging into this almost social insect like level of cooperation, even though we're primates. Um, but I think that alcohol is another one of these these cultural tools. So we, we need tools like religion and alcohol because we're a primate living in an ecological niche that's very not primate-like. Um, the ways in which we cooperate and um, uh, trust and play. I mean, the way in, in which we, we're like puppies. So um, when I look at some of the research on play and we've been compared to the, the Labradors of the primate world, right? Uh, we have, compared to chimpanzees, we're, we featured neoteny, so we have very um, juvenile traits. And you see this in domesticated dogs as related to wolves. Um, so we're, we're a playful species compared to other species. And then things like alcohol make us even more playful, <laughs> at least temporarily. Um, and these are, these are not just, for humans, play is not just fun. It's actually crucial for creativity and cooperation. So we have to be a playful species to be able to inhabit this niche that we've taken as our own. Mm -hmm. And all of this also applies to small scale societies, right? You're not only referring to our modern industrialized big scale societies, correct? Yeah, no, it applies to small scale societies as well. Um, it just becomes a more urgent problem once you start getting up to the large village level. Once you start cooperating, having to cooperate with strangers, that's when things get really tricky. Um, arguably, if you're you're at the level of a small hunter-gatherer band, uh, kin selection and reciprocal altruism can do all the work that needs to be done in the same way it does for our primate cousins. Um, but once we start settling down, um, or once we start even you know pre-agriculture. So Manvir Singh has been arguing recently, and he's, I think he's right about this, that you've got very complex, large-scale societies without agriculture, pre-agriculture. Mm -hmm. In parts of the world, like where, where I live, the Pacific Northwest, where you have these really rich marine resources, and you can build, you can basically, um, you have the equivalent of agricultural surpluses without having to do agriculture, just because the environment's so rich. And once you get that, you get very complex, um, large-scale societies with 
classes and social stratification and slavery and warfare. Um, so any, t especially when we start moving into groups above a certain, you know, maybe Dunbar number limit, these, these cultural technologies become much more important. Mm -hmm. So are there any aspects of our human civilizations that were maybe influenced by consuming alcohol, like, for example, the arts, religion, and, and things like that? So whether the consumption of alcohol is influencing culture? Mm -hmm. Right. And the development of these particular things. Yeah, well, I mean, clearly it's involved in creativity. So one of the functions of alcohol that I look at is it, um, so, you know, creativity and when here I'm talking about kind of lateral thinking creativity. So um, creativity where you can't just power through an algorithm to get to the answer. You have to think laterally. And there are ways to get at this type of creativity in the lab by doing things like a uh, mode associate test, right? I give you three words that seem very unrelated and you have to figure out a fourth word that relates them. Um, you can't solve problems like this just by cranking through an algorithm. You have to kind of relax and just see it. Those kind of aha insights. And there's, you know, it's long been uh, folklore. So folk views have been that alcohol and other intoxicants are crucial for this sort of inspiration, which is why alcohol has been associated with the arts and with shamans, you know, creative shamans and all these types of insights in every culture we know um, for uh, as long as we have written records. And there's there's good experimental evidence that this is true. So um, what what seems to interfere with lateral thinking is our prefrontal cortex. So you know the PSC is really important, keeps us on task, it keeps us focused, it allows us to delay gratification. Um, but it seems to be the enemy when we're faced with a lateral thinking task. The PSC is a problem and you need to get rid of it somehow. Um, and there are various ways you could do that, um, but the most simple and effective is a couple of drinks. Um, so I look at the literature on um, Alison Gopnik's work on creativity in children. So she shows that uh, your ability to solve these kind of lateral thinking tasks just drops with age. So four-year-olds are great at it, adults are terrible. Um, and I plot that against the um, growth, the maturation of the prefrontal cortex. And basically, this is tracking as your prefrontal cortex gets more mature, you get less good at doing these lateral tasks. Um, so I'm arguing that one of the functions of alcohol and other intoxicants is to temporarily take the PFC offline so we can think in these creative ways and come up with totally new solutions. Um, and, and then, but then it wears off and we're adults again, and we can actually do something with those insights. Cause she, Allison refers to kids as like the R and D department of the human race. And then um, adults are marketing and kind of marketing and implementation. Um, but I think it's four year olds aren't really that useful. <laughs> the kind of insights they have are not helpful. Um, so I think what you really need is, is to become temporarily become a four year old for a little bit in certain ways. And then but then you come out of it and you're an adult. And you can the things that you are laterally thinking about are actually useful things like technological problems or social problems you need to solve. Um, so I think alcohol and other intoxicants have had a huge impact on just the advance of culture. So the way in which we've developed new technologies and new religious forms and art forms. Um, but then also religion is often organized around chemical intoxication. And so one of the things I talk about in the book is the ways in which, um, you know, I, you know, a bit about the cognitive science of religion and evolutionary approaches to religion. And if you read that literature, um, when they're talking about the cognitive effects of ritual, they're focusing on synchrony, they're focusing on um, pain, you know, physical pain, costly, right. like Demetrius Cyclatus's work. Um, what they never talk about is the fact that most, most of the time when people are doing these rituals, they're wasted. <laughs> you know, they're, <laughs> they're really drunk or they're doing, they're taking chemical intoxicants, they're taking hallucinogens. Um, and it's interesting, there's been, it's been a blind spot 
in both the anthropology and cognitive science of religion, the role that chemical intoxicants have played in these events. Um, and I think it's partly due to this kind of puritanical discomfort we have with intoxicants. Um, mm -hmm. So um, another thing in the book that I'm trying to push is we need to, when we're doing cognitive science of religion, anthropology of religion, we need to not be squeamish about pointing out that people are generally getting pretty, pretty intoxicated during these events. And that probably is facilitating the kind of bonding and other functions that these rituals have. Mm -hmm. Because the rituals themselves, through things like synchronicity, for example, also promote uh, social bonding and trust. Right? Uh, absolutely, yeah, they promote. So that's got you know that's got to be right. You know, mark doing these things where you're chanting and doing things. Uh, promotes in-group identification. There's good experimental evidence on that. Um, just engaging in costly behavior. So staying up all night and doing this ritual, maybe scarifying yourself or sticking things through your cheeks. Um, first of all, the pain is intoxicating. So that helps with the kind of group bonding. Um, but then it's a costly signal, right? So, you know, uh, costly signaling theory, I'm saying that I really believe in this stuff because why else would I stick this thing through my cheek and stay up all night dancing. Um, so those are all things that we talk about and understand well. Um, what I'm arguing is we also have to, all of this is being facilitated by this background consumption of chemical intoxicants, which is reinforcing the effects of these other things. Mm -hmm. And maybe making them possible, right? Um, it's, you know, painful things are less painful if you're anesthetized with a bit of alcohol. So. <laughs> Right. And I think that in the book, you also mentioned the examples of several uh, high tech companies in Silicon Valley where the programmers also resort to alcohol to become more creative, I think. Yeah. So actually, the, the idea for this book probably started um, since 2012, I think. No, it must have been later than that. 2014, maybe. Um, I was at uh, CASBIS, the Center for Advanced Studies at Stanford, and I did a talk. Um, they had a talk series with the local Google campus, the Menlo Park Google campus. Um, and I did a talk on trying not to try, so my, my last trade book. And I, in passing, mentioned the study that showed that creativity peaked at around 0.08 blood alcohol content. So there's only one that I know of one experimental study that directly measures the effect of alcohol and creativity and was this one study. Um, and after the talk, the first question, the guy raised his hand, he said, have you ever heard about the Balmer peak? And I hadn't, but this is supposedly this is, I don't know if it's myth mythical, uh, but Steve Balmer you know, from Microsoft, legendary coder, apparently believed that his coding ability peaked at the certain blood alcohol content, very narrow blood alcohol content. And so he would keep himself hooked up to an alcoholic IV to just be at that blood alcohol content. Um, and so that was a great example. And then after the talk, they took me on a tour of the campus. And the first place they took me, they were like, you have to see this. And they took me to their whiskey room. So this was this room where they, um, they had an amazing, because I, I like single malt scotch, an amazing collection of rare single malt scotches, this whole wall full. Um, and then, you know, beanbag chairs and a foosball table and places to hang out. And they said that when they get stuck, um, when they're working on a problem and they're just, they need a lateral thinking breakthrough, instead of sitting at their computers and kind of banging their head against the wall, they go to this room and drink a little bit of scotch and maybe play a little foosball. And next thing you know, they start to have some new ideas and figure things out. And that's when I thought, huh, you know, I knew I had known about this connection between creativity and alcohol from the Zhuangs, from the Try Not to Try book and my, the relationship between Zhuangzi and being drunk on heaven. That's how it comes into Try Not to Try. But this um, this tour of the Google campus made me think, wow, you know, groups, cultural groups are using this in a very intentional way to get past problems, in this case, a creativity problem. Um, and so that's when I, that's actually when I first started thinking seriously about writing this book, um, that um, it seems like alcohol is being used as a tool in a, in a very specific way.
Mm-hmm. So yeah, so yeah, organizations use it all the time. Mm-hmm. So in terms of all of these benefits we're talking about, particularly from a social perspective, uh, we get them by drinking small to moderate quantities of alcohol, or the, does it also happen with large quantities? Yeah, that's a tricky topic. So there's clear benefits to uh, you know mild intoxication. So up to like 0.08 is when you should shouldn't drive a car anymore. Um, that's about two drinks in for most people. Um, once you get to 0.10, things start to get a little bit more out of control. Um, large quantity. There's I, I look at some of the literature on um, kind of ecstatic experience slash costly signaling. It's it's possible that occasional like serious, either serious drinking sessions or sessions where you're doing hallucinogens with others where you're completely disconnected from reality um, may have some important effects. But that's, mm-hmm. it gets really dangerous then. And especially, um, dangerous as I talk about in the book, because we now have access to liquor. Um, So distilled distilled liquors are super dangerous. They're really powerful. (laughs) Like you can't, it's really hard to kill yourself on beer, Um, but it's really easy to kill yourself with vodka. And so that's that's a new danger that I'm not sure we've adapted even culturally to, um, this access to distilled liquors. So I, I, it's possible that alcohol in excess has functions, these occasional kind of ecstatic experiences. So where we're getting really getting out of our sense of ourselves in a, in a dramatic way. Um, and then possibly also doing that in the company of others is an important kind of bonding experience. So I, I talk about, um, in this book, Stealing Fire, this was a popular trade book a few years ago. Um, the authors talk about this, they interviewed this Navy SEAL commander who at the end of the training session takes all of the trainees out to a local bar and they get really drunk, like, you know, on doing shots and way, blowing way past 0.08. Um, and his view that doing that occasionally, like an occasional blowout drinking session like that, bonds his group together in a way that he doesn't know any better way to do it. Um, so there is possibly a function for these occasional kind of um, extreme drinking events. But, you know, it's also difficult to talk about those kind of things because it is it is dangerous. Um, and then you really have to get into all the literature on um, binge drinking among college students, which is really dangerous. And um, it's not something you really want to advocate. But there there are people out there who argue that occasional like really heavy drinking sessions may have these kind of almost like a you know an initiation ritual type effect Mm -hmm. but most of the way that people have traditionally used alcohol is is at relatively moderate levels where you're getting all the bonding and creativity effects um but you're not you're not in danger of killing yourself or harming yourself Also, because if I'm not mistaken, when people get drunk, particularly men and even more so particular particular subsets of men get more violent, for example. They can. Um, So this is um, what alcohol is. One of the many things alcohol is doing is disinhibiting you, right? It's down regulating your PFC, which means that you the, the, the thing that's in charge of controlling impulses is now off duty. <laughs> um, and so that can be, if your impulses are aggressive, that will make you aggressive. Um, so it's alcohol is one of the few drugs that increases aggressiveness. Um, but it seems to only increase aggressiveness if you're already prone to aggression or you already have reasons to be aggressive. Um, so it's basically just, it's, it's taking away the playground monitor and then you're going to see some impulses that were previously being suppressed. Um, so that's why it could be dangerous. I mean, we have the PFC for a really good impulse control is a really good thing. <laughs> and so, um, and you know, we evolved it for a very good reason. And so you want to be really careful, um, 
and how much you, when you take that away and to what degree you take that away. Yeah. So apart from these benefits, and I would like to ask you about this because this is a very interesting part of the book, you also say that um, it's good for us to feel pleasure for pleasure's sake. Could you tell yeah. us about that? Yeah. So the, um, you know, I'm telling a functional story about alcohol. And then near the end of the book, I talk a little bit more about just the hedonic value of it. Um, and so part of the, part of the point of the book is to defend functional things because I think we need to defend functional things. So for instance, um, you know, in debates and organizations about whether or not you allow alcohol at say, um, company functions, you've got, if you're the decision maker on that, on the one side, you have, um, here's all the bad things that could happen, uh, people getting, people drunk driving, sexual harassment. There's all these bad things that could happen, potential lawsuits. What's on the positive side? Fun, right? That's it. Um, and so if it's all these costs versus fun, fun's gonna almost always lose. And so I think it's important to point out that on the other side, it's not just fun. It's functional benefits like enhanced creativity, enhanced bonding, you know, group identity. Um, but then at the end of the book, I want to say, but let's not forget about the fun. <laughs> like fun is good too. Um, and possibly one of the functions of alcohol historically has been just giving us a vacation from the self. So um, humans, as far as we know, are the only self-conscious animal. And self-consciousness evolved for w whatever reason. Um, it's, it's clearly useful. It allows us to do things no other animal can do. Um, but it's sometimes it just sucks, right? As <laughs> you want to break. Uh, so I look at some of the literature on what's been sometimes called the curse of the self, right? This kind of, um, this hyper consciousness of yourself and having that turned off for a little while, um, is pleasurable. Um, and alcohol is also just directly pleasurable. It's directly stimulating endorphins and other things that give us pleasure. Um, and we, we have a kind of squeamishness as a society about thinking it's okay to just have pleasure for pleasure's sake. Um, there's this, I quote at length, this uh, author, UK author, St Stuart Walton, who wrote this great book on alcohol and other intoxicants and who's, who really rails against this kind of um, puritanical Victorian squeamishness about pleasure. Um, and, and he actually had a big effect on me writing the book because I was making this functional argument. I was like, you know what? We also have to just defend, somebody needs to defend pleasure for pleasure's sake as well. Um, and you could make a, you could tell a functional story about pleasure, like how having an occasional vacation from the self is functionally useful in that it maybe makes us um, accept our role in society more readily. It maybe makes us more efficient the next day. Um, but pro in terms of, you can tell an evolutionary story about it, but we don't want to lose sight of the proximate psychology mm -hmm. and the proximate psychology is just that sometimes it's fun and pleasurable and we should appreciate that at the surface level as well. Yeah. Uh, so do you think that Nietzsche was onto something when he praised Dionysian experiences? Yeah, so he, I talk a little bit about him at the end of the book in terms of this, the, he, he's the one who set up, sets up this dichotomy between Apollo and Dionysus, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm arguing what he's, one other way to talk about this is the PFC versus the non-PFC self, right? Mm -hmm. um, so Apollo is when the PFC is in control. You know, you're rational, you're controlled, you're doing things in the proper order, nothing's out of place. Um, and that's really crucial. Um, Nietzsche's argument is that you need the Dionysian as well. You need these moments of excess and pleasure and ecstasy in the, in the Greek sense, you know, ex, ecstasis, getting outside yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you need that for, um, I mean, for him, it's about 
realizing yourself as the, the Ubermensch, right? The, the Superman. Um, mm. But, you know, societies need this. We, we, um, we rely on the kind of insights you get from people who engage in Dionysian excess. Um, and we as individuals need it to, to balance our lives, at least occasionally. Um, so yeah, there's got a, um, I mean, I'm down the road, I'm c contemplating a book on hedonism, um, kind of defensive hedonism <laughs> and it needs to be pleasure and intelligent pleasure, right? Not just mindless. Uh, I mean, pleasure that includes the pleasures of talking about ideas, figuring things out. Um, but chemical intoxication is one of those pleasures and it, it, it should have a role in our lives. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, we've already talked how alcohol or the consumption of alcohol is so ubiquitous across societies. So with that being the case, do we know where prejudices against alcohol come from because there are some societies and some institutions that really are against alcohol consumption right yeah so i mean so people have been drinking forever and they've been worried about drinking forever so drinking is really dangerous um, it can lead to um, especially because it's clear that um, for a long time we've a certain subset of the populations genetically prone to alcoholism and if you're you're inclined toward alcoholism, alcohol can be really dangerous for you. So, um, you know, as far back as ancient China, we have people trying to impose prohibition. So there's one of the earliest legal documents we have from China it includes this um, this statute that anyone caught drinking will be put to death. So it's pretty pretty <laughs> serious prohibition. Um, but it didn't work, right? The Chinese kept drinking and been drinking for you know the last many millennia. Um, in ancient Egypt, you have accounts of alcoholics. So people, there's this uh, very poignant letter from a teacher to a former student who's clearly an alcoholic, you know, lamenting the cost of this. Um, so as long as we've had alcohol, we've had worries about alcohol. It's a really double-edged thing. It's got these valuable functions, but when used to excess or not used the right way, it can be dangerous. Um, and in my um, in the early chapter, when I'm trying to argue against uh, evolutionary hijack or mismatch theories, I bring up the fact that there are these cultural groups that said, hey, you know what the solution to this problem is? Let's just not drink or not use intoxicants at all. Um, so there are cultural groups that have, have with varying amounts of success, banned alcohol and other intoxicants. And, but what's interesting is that they, you would, if alcohol really were, so in the same way that the Asian flushing gene, if alcohol were really just a net cost, mm -hmm. you'd expect that genetic solution to the problem to have spread more widely than it has. In the same way, if alcohol is a net cost, you'd expect that cultural groups that prohibit alcohol would immediately start out competing other cultural groups and kind of take over the world. Um, and that just hasn't happened. So prohibition is an ancient idea. Lots of cultural groups have tried it. Um, if you look at the distribution of prohibition right now in the world, it hasn't gone very far. You know, so it's, it's basically the Muslim world. Um, it's, um, it's strictly enforced in some places and a lot of other places it's not at all. Historically, Islam has been very um, kind of, and especially in some areas, pretty loose about it. So drinking by elites is winked at. Um, some of the greatest wine poetry in the world comes from the Islamic world. <laughs> These people are drinking <laughs> massive quantities of wine. Um, so it's, it's puzzling if, if forbidding alcohol were such a great solution. It's puzzling why Islam has not managed to be more consistent about it. <clears throat> and it's puzzling why it hasn't, too, so it has been much more consistent about this than, say, Christianity, um, why it hasn't immediately started out competing other groups. And so at the, in the book, I talk about this encounter um, where this uh, uh, Islamic uh, envoy is going to uh, meet with the, uh, going up the Volga River to meet with a group that's recently converted to Islam. And it seems to be, you know, the 
Khalif wanting to check up on these people and make sure they're really doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and he, along the way, meets this group of Vikings. So you have this encounter between these two cultural groups, mm -hmm. one of whom, at least at the time, is you know, very much prohibitionist, no alcohol, no chemical intoxicants. And he writes with horror about the Vikings, how drunk they get. They get so drunk they'd fall, you know, they'd fall asleep around the fire. Um, they pass out, um, and they have they use they use alcohol in this really excessive way. And we know this is a feature of Viking culture. Um, you'd expect that, and this is in the 700s AD. If alcohol were really just a net cost this group should have completely wiped out this other group. Um, and yet it didn't. Like, the Vikings were pretty successful. Um, you know, they dominated vast swaths of Northern Europe for a long time. They went to the Americas. If you, if you want to talk about successful cultural groups, one of the ones that would pop into mind is the Vikings. Um, and yet they were, they used alcohol in this really extreme way. So yeah, there have been anti-alcohol groups and people have tried prohibition it's been difficult to impose. And those groups, again, haven't been as successful as you would predict if alcohol didn't have some countervailing positive functions in addition, in addition to its obvious costs, right? Mm -hmm. Right, and, and taking, in, uh, taking into account all of those benefits we've been talking about and also the fact that nowadays we have easy access to large quantities of alcohol, would you say that using alcohol in modern industrialized societies is a net positive or a net negative? Yeah, that's that's trickier. <laughs> I think it's obviously been adaptive um, in our evolutionary history and recently, you know, in historical times. Um, as I talk about in the last chapter, there's there's two relatively new developments that make alcohol a lot more dangerous and might change that balance between cost and benefit. Um, and one of them is dis distillation, right? So for most of our history with alcohol, it's been in the form of beers and wines. <clears throat> and you can't, in, ter in natural fermentation, you can't get above about 16% mm -hmm. alcohol by volume because that's when the yeast start to shut down from the alcohol. Um, so we've been, there's been a ceiling on how strong beverages could get. The way around that is distillation. So you boil a wine or a beer, capture the alcohol, cool it down, and you've got, you can't get 100%, but you can get pretty pure alcohol that way. Um, and we've understood the principles of distillation for a really long time. So Aristotle wrote about it. But it actually is technologically really difficult to pull off. It requires mastering a bunch of different technologies that all have to come together. And so we didn't have distillation on a large scale until, in evolutionary terms, yesterday, basically. So probably in China, maybe the 13th century. China was probably the first, so probably around the 13th century in China. And then not until really 16th to 18th century in Europe which sounds like a long time ago when you're not thinking in evolutionary terms. But, you know, it's basically yesterday. I give a timeline where I show here's where 10 million years ago our ancestors adapted to consuming alcohol. You know, here's where people start making alcohol. Let's expand that. Here's where we start making alcohol. And this is this little blip at the end is where we suddenly discover distilled liquors. So that's new. And liquors are just really, you know, so you're going from at, most of our history, we've been drinking 2 to 3% ABV beers. And if we've had access to fruit wine, we can maybe get up to 8%, 9%. Um, it's really only with these new yeast strains we've developed that you can get like these uh, Aussie Syrahs, these, these wines that get up to 16, sometimes hit 17% ABV. Um, but if, if you're making a leap from a 2 to 3% alcohol beer to a you know, whatever, 94% alcohol, vodka, that's really a big leap. Um, and then um, distilled liquors could preserve well, they're easy to store, they last for a long time, you could accumulate them, you could trade them. Um, I think they're, they're game changers in a way. They make alcohol a lot more accessible in really potent forms, and they make it more dangerous. Um, so, so that's one new thing. And then the other, so I call, that's the distillation problem. 
Right. The other new problem of modernity is isolation. So as long as people have been using alcohol, they've been using it communally. So you, you, it's very, it's a very rare society where you would have private access to alcohol. Alcohol mm -hmm. was brewed communally and it was served and consumed communally. And that means you're always doing it in a communal ritual context. And there are all these clever ritual tricks that people have independently come, you know, it's convergent cultural evolution. They've independently come up with this around the world for moderating consumption. So at a, a Greek symposium, the symposiarch, the head of the symposium was in charge of, they would water down their wine. So he was in charge of mixing the water and the wine. And he could do that in different proportions, depending on if he thought people should get more drunk or less drunk. <laughs> um, he was in charge of making the toasts. And, you know, so you don't drink until there's a toast. Um, same thing in Chinese banquet um, rituals. You don't, and this is true today. Um, you don't drink, you're not just sitting there drinking at will. There's these little cups of baijiu, this really powerful liquor, sorghum liquor. Um, and you drink when there's a toast. So someone, someone says, let's toast to this, and everyone drinks, and then the thing gets refilled. Um, who is allowed to propose toasts is ritually determined. There's, there's, there's limits. And someone, so the toastmaster, the host of the banquet, is able, at least in theory, to moderate people's drinking. Uh, we also know that even in, you know, very informal gatherings where you think there's no ritual stuff going on at all. So just like whatever, meeting at a pub with your friends and drinking or like kids, even kids drinking at a house party. Um, we know experimentally and ethnographically that you're watching the consumption of other people and you're, it's called uh, match drinking. So you're, you're moderating or in some cases ramping up, but in any case you're coordinating your drinking with the group. And that's another way that groups use to kind of keep drinking ideally under control. So that can go, if you have a kind of pathological culture like frat, American university frat culture that can go really sideways. <laughs> um, people yeah. could end up matching up in a way that's really unhelpful. But the, usually the way it works is it keeps people moderate. Everyone stays at the same level of inebriation. Um, what's new is the fact that humans now can go to a corner store and buy enough alcohol to kill a herd of elephants and take that home with them to their private home and drink it alone. <laughs> you know, with yes. no supervision, and that's crazy. Um, and so I actually just finished writing a piece um, that um, was commissioned by Time Magazine on COVID, kind of drinking during COVID times. Um, so this was already, distillation and isolation were already dangers. And then I think they're even worse with COVID lockdowns because people have shifted their drinking from out in pubs with other people in social ways to drinking at home. And that's really dangerous. So you're drinking completely unsupervised or just with your immediate family, whoever you're um, in lockdown with, you don't have the same social cues that you would normally have about now you've had enough. <laughs> Maybe, you know, yeah. the disapproving look from your mother-in-law as you pour yourself another <laughs> glass of wine and you say, okay, maybe I'll just <laughs> stick with what I got now, right? All that's gone. And so people are now drinking, it looks more like these studies of rats and stress and alcohol where they're given feeding tubes and they can just drink as much alcohol as they want from the feeding tubes. Right. That doesn't go, that doesn't go very well. <laughs> and it's because we're not, we're not evolutionarily adapted to unlimited amounts of distilled liquors that we can drink at will with no social limits. Um, and that's where we find ourselves now, especially in lockdown and that's dangerous. Um, so I'm open to the possibility that um, certainly in COVID times, alcohol may be dangerous. Um, but also if we're, we're consuming alcohol, we're consuming distilled liquors and we're doing so in ways that are not so that are not communal. Mm -hmm. That that's dangerous, I think. Right. And so, it, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just going to ask you, so 
do we know of any good alternatives to alcohol? Because I mean, other intoxicants or perhaps other social activities we can participate in to get the same positive effects without the negatives. Yeah, so I talk a bit about that. Um, so there are not, there have always been non chemical intoxicant ways to get intoxicated. And various religious groups have used these. So um, think about the Sufis, right? So they don't consume alcohol, but they get high essentially through these all night dance dancing rituals, right? So you can use dance, you can use um, uh, starvation, you can use fasting, you can use sleep deprivation. Um, extreme exercise can shut down the prefrontal cortex. So there's some work on um, Arne Dietrich has done work on hypofrontality, he calls it, where it's, you know, the runner's high comes from the fact that when you're really stressing your body and exercise, it shunts blood down to the muscles and the heart and, you know, prefrontal cortex, we don't need that right now. <laughs> so you get a little bit of a high because the prefrontal cortex gets downregulated. Um, so there are definitely non-chemical ways to downregulate the prefrontal cortex. Um, you get, the way, practically speaking, um, and you see organizations doing this, it's possible that putting people like doing, you know, escape room outings or laser tag outings where people are maybe exercising or they're scared or they're, um, you know, they're experiencing extreme emotions, working as a group may give you the same kind of group bonding effect that meeting at the pub for happy hour would give you. Um, so it's possible that there are non-alcoholic um, alternatives you could use. Um, in terms of other drugs, uh, I look a little bit at this, uh, the trend of microdosing. So this idea that um, the problem with psychedelics is that in their normal form, so in the form they come in nature, so psilocybin or mescaline, um, they're just too powerful to use socially or to use in everyday life. They just mm -hmm. completely disconnect you from reality. Um, but now that we can synthesize psychedelics and deliver them in different doses, there's been an argument that microdosing psychedelics might be a way to get some of the high, some of the lateral thinking benefits, some, maybe even some of the bonding benefits in a way that mimics alcohol but is less dangerous. So certainly psychedelics are much less dangerous than alcohol. Um, alcohol is really it's super addictive. <laughs> it's, <laughs> um, it's physiologically um, costly. It really imposes damage on your liver. Um, mm. so, so drugs like psychedelics, if they could be used in a less extreme form, might be a, a good alternative to alcohol because they they are physiologically less costly and as far as we know they're not addictive so there's no problems with addiction when it comes to psychedelics right so one last question that i have here with all of that in mind uh, how do you think we should communicate about alcohol consumption particularly to young people because those uh, these are some of the people who are most prone to abusing alcohol consumption i guess yeah that's a very real live issue for me because i have a 14 year old daughter <laughs> so <laughs> she's entering into those ages where this becomes an issue um so one of the things i argue in the book in terms of mitigating the dangers of alcohol is um, emulating southern drinking cultures versus northern drinking cultures so this is referring to europe um, uh, but Northern European cultures tend to be binge drinking cultures. They tend to drink distilled liquors. Alcohol is not well integrated into daily life. It's something you do on the weekends and you do it to excess and you drink to get drunk. You know, you do, it's really extreme drinking. Right. It's, taboo, it's taboo. It's something adults do and kids don't do. Um, Southern drinking cultures like Italy or Spain or Portugal, I imagine, um, tend to be more wine-based or beer-based. Mm -hmm. um, drinking is part of everyday life. It's just what you do at mealtimes. Um, yeah. It's done in smaller amounts. Um, it's introduced to children at an early age. So kids, so my, my ex-wife is half Italian and my, so my daughter grew up 
going to Italy every year. And um, our Italian relatives, you, you, know, you drink wine at meals. The kids get wine watered down when they're young. As they get older, they can sip a bit of wine with a meal. Um, I'm, I argue in the book that this trains, this teaches kids that alcohol is a normal part of life. It can, it's, there's nothing special about it. There's nothing taboo about it. It's kind of just part of a well-rounded life. Um, it's got this role to play. And there's some evidence that if you tr train kids that way or they grow up in a culture like that, they're less prone to alcoholism. So southern drinking cultures have much lower rates of alcoholism. Even though pr you would presume the genetic propensity is there just as much as it is elsewhere, it doesn't come out because you don't drink to excess there. Um, and I remember this, uh, one of my first, I could, probably the first visit to Italy, um, we had, you know, meal, we had just arrived and we had dinner and everyone had wine with dinner and then everyone was going to bed and I poured myself a glass of wine to take with me to the bedroom because I was going to read and it was a really, it was really good wine. I was living in Canada at the time, like actually I get access to really good Italian wine um, and I wanted to savor it and read a book and I remember getting a look from one of my in-laws like, what are you doing? Like you just don't take wine away from the table, right? You you drink at the table with everyone else as part of the meal, and when the meal is over, everything is over. Um, that's a very effective way to regulate drinking. Um, mm -hmm. So so practically speaking, with my daughter, I've tried to you know she's grown up in a basically a southern drinking culture. Um, I let her start actually starting when she was 13 i would let her have a little sip of whatever i was drinking wine wise um and asked her about it you know like what do you taste and what do you smell i have her smell it and she's actually developed a really good palate so she'll try something and be like she doesn't have the vocabulary yet to describe what she's tasting but she's getting the ideas um so um i think that helps like in it you know teaching kids that it's not this taboo thing it's actually a normal part of life helps them so hopefully then when she encounters binge drinking cultures, which she will in her high school and when she goes to college, she'll have a more balanced view of the role of alcohol in life than kids who were denied alcohol and only were experienced it, you know, out in the woods before the high school dance getting drunk on liquor. So um, I think that's one way. Um, it's so one way cultures have developed tricks for taming, taming Dionysus, if you want to put it that way, um, enjoying the benefits of Dionysus without, while well, taming, taking the edges off the danger. Yeah. Okay. So the book is again drunk. How we sip, dance, and stumbled our way to civilization. Uh, Doctor Slingerland, just before we go, where can people find you on the internet? Um, so. Put my name into Google. Um, I, I'll have a new, I have a new website that'll be up in. Actually, by the time this airs, I should have a website up. So uh, it's just edwardslinderland.com. Edwardslinderland one word dot com is my new um, personal website. Or if you Google me, you'll get also get my UBC site. Yeah. Okay. So, Doctor Slingerland, thank you for writing the book. It was a real good read, and thank you for coming on the show again. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a lot of fun. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. So it is thanks to people like you that the show has been running for such a long time, more than three years now. And I would like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you prefer PayPal, you can also find links to it in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like, hit the subscription button and comment on it. This show is brought to you by Enlights, the learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Kenny Litzka and Blanchett Perga, Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bernardo Wolf, Tim Hollis, Enrique Alenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, 
Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Bosch, Bo Weingart, Becca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Plyfe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenk, Walla Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslam Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliz, Miran B, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Max Bailby, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Alman, my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardus France and Niroban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.